Well, uh, with that, we are going to start the program of the day. Uh, our first panel is going to be led by here, my colleague, Christian Rodriguez, who I'm just by you and you saying thank you for all of these years too. We were just remembering when we were students in here, he was in Harvard and MIT, and people wanted to solve energy, and we got a call from the ambassador, so I think he might tell more about that. Uh, I know. Uh, and we continue talking about energy. So with that introduction, I'm going to let Christian come to his podium. Uh, the podium is yours, Christian. Maybe instead of the podium, maybe we could just invite the panelists uh, to, to sit down. So, Yal and Forrest, uh, Ignacio and Felipe, uh, if they're somewhere around. Thank you, Yuli. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, thank you, Chiu and Mas, for, for the wonderful invitation. My, my name is Christian Rodriguez. I'm a, I'm a senior advisor at the Boston Consulting Group and, most importantly, a fellow here at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, working uh, for my boss there, Marcela Renteria. Um, I'm delighted to, 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 to be moderating this panel called uh, Clean Tech, Energy for a Clean, for, for a clean Future. Uh, and I think uh, Julie already kind of started the story I wanted to tell. Uh, so just, just a little bit of an anecdote here. Ran around uh, 2011, 2012, and a group of students led by, who has been leading Chilean students in Massachusetts for the last uh, number of years, Julie Fuentes, gathered around the topic of energy. Uh, and we actually named ourselves. We were the Chile Boston Energia uh, Initiative. And we basically met at MIT, I think, you know, twice a week or so, and we started to brainstorm and think you know, how could we really foster and develop the relationship between the Commonwealth and, uh, and Chile in terms of energy, uh, in terms of energy, right? And if you think about 2011, what was happening in terms of renewals, particularly in Chile, kind of starting, you know, still prices very high, uh, it was really kind of the right time. So there we were, you know, trying to, to, to develop this. And one day, our boss, Yuli, gets a call from uh, Ambassador Felipe Bulnes, uh, who at the time was, had started to push this little initiative that you may know called the Chile Mass. Uh, and it was basically Felipe Woods and, of course, Governor Deval Patrick. Uh, and they were like, Yuli, we want to put a panel on energy. Can you help us? Uh, and then comes Yuli and, you know, tell, tells uh, to the group and say, hey, we have this amazing opportunity to actually work in the thing. I'm not sure I'm convinced about the name. Their name called Chile Mass, but, you know, why not? So. Uh, then, you know, long story short, then we were no longer Chile Boston Energia, but we were just the students who ramp up in Chile Mass, and, uh, and that's how actually, the, from the student side, really energy, and particularly renewable energy, was the, the, the birth and the, the cradle for the student, uh, the, the, the student community in Boston engaging in, in, in Chile Mass. So, you know, fast forward. 10 years, and it's really, really rewarding to see we, we know what Yuli, what uh, the board, Marcelo, others, uh, Fernanda, et cetera, has, have done really for, for the collaboration of the Commonwealth and Chile, and particularly for Chile in terms of renewal. So it's really a job, a job well done, and one of the most beautiful uh, initiatives that, you know, that, that I, I, I've seen, you know, in Chile overseas. So with that long introduction, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce the panels here for, for, for this discussion, and then, and then move, on, move on with it. So first, uh, we're really honored uh, with the presence of Professor Forrest Reinhardt, uh, who's a global expert on the interface between climate change, business, and energy. He is the John D. Black Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School and the co-chair of Harvard Business School's Global Energy Seminar. Uh, at HBS, he teaches a course on global markets, helping business leaders understand the economic and political environment in which businesses are conducted. 
uh, and also serves as course head for the required MBA course strategy. Reinhardt uh, currently serves as the faculty chair of Harvard Business School's Asia Pacific Research Center, as chair of the HBS Executive Education Asia Pacific Region, and most importantly, as Latin America chair uh, of uh, um, Anderson Standard Co-Chair of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies uh, here. So we're very thankful uh, for, for your collaboration with Dr. Klaas. Felipe de Musi at the center uh, spent more than 15 years leading private and public sector projects in Chile, working closely with local and indigenous communities. Throughout his career, Felipe co-founded an educational NGO, founded different business, coordinated public investment in community infrastructure, and also served at the Chamber of Deputies in the Chilean Congress from 2014 to 2018, focusing on finance, labor, and human rights. Since 2019, Felipe has been part of LILAC Solutions, uh, a company that seeks to scale lithium solutions by applying a technology that extracts the mineral without the need for evaporation ponds, where currently he's the president for South America, and I believe that's what you will uh, tell us a little bit about your experience there. Gallen Nelson, also an honor to have you here, is the chief program officer at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, MassCC, as most of you know what, where he oversees technology and market development programs and initiatives across the organization's buildings, transportation, and net zero grid sectors. Gallen serves of MassCC uh, executives team helping to inform organizational strategy and direction and oversees the organization's emerging climate finance work. Uh, prior to his role, Gallen led, led Mass CEC Innovation and Industry Support, where he created and managed several tech-to-market and commercialization acceleration programs, including in the microgrid, energy storage, and high-performance uh, building sectors. Last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Jose Ignacio Escobar, a civil engineer on, of industries with diploma in electrical engineer from Universidad Católica de Chile, a master in economic regulation from Universidad Alfredo Ibáñez, has over 20 years of experience in the renewable energy industry, uh, uh, where he's been characterized for having an active role in the development of these technologies in Chile. After founding and developing several companies related to solar and wind energy, in 2014 he joined the Spanish firm Acciona, first as general director of its energy business unit in Chile and then as general director of South America Energy Platform. In 2022, he became the CEO of Colbún, one of the leading energy companies in Chile with the aim of accelerating its growth in renewables, energy solutions, and expansion in the region. In addition, between 2017 and 2022, he was president of ACERA, an association that promotes the development of renewable energies in Chile. So as, as you can see, very, very excited to have this you know, fantastic panel with us. And actually, a, a little bit of a, virtu a, a virtuous cycle there between Professor Reinhardt and, and Jose Ignacio, because Professor Reinhardt, 10 years ago, I believe, wrote the first case uh, at Harvard Business School on Colbún. Uh, and is further developing that work. So I think he's, uh, he's of course, you know, passionate about energy and particularly renewable energy, and he will certainly, you know, uh, honor us with opening this panel uh, now. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, everyone, for your um, presence here. It's an honor to be invited to be in this panel. As you heard, everybody else on the panel is an expert in Chile or an expert in renewable energy or both. And I am neither, so I represent the rest of us here in Massachusetts, the other seven million. Um, but it is true that about a decade ago, I wrote a business school case about Colburn. Um, Jose Ignacio was not yet at the firm. He was like still in primary school, I think. But, um, <laughs> but as, as some of you know, a, a case at the business school, it's not like a law case. It's, it's an opportunity to have a discussion, right? And I, I wrote the case. Um, <coughs> because I wanted to have an easy way of communicating some very simple lessons about the basic politics and basic economics of energy supply, because I think, um, and I continue to think, that too many of the conversations we have about energy supply, at least in this country, are sort of divorced from the fundamental economic realities of, of energy, right? Um, so the, when I've, I've taught this Colburn case, I think, more than I've taught any other single case that I've ever written. Um, it's, and, and so it's valuable for teaching these basic lessons. Like, you know, maybe this is old, old news to all of you. I hope so. But you know, there's a huge fundamental difference between technologies that are cheap to build and expensive to run, like natural gas, and technologies that are expensive to build but then cheap to run, like wind. And, and the implications of those choices matter a lot for the firms and for society. And how you make those trade-offs depends on capacity utilization and on, um, <coughs> on the discount rate. 
on the opportunity cost of the capital, right? So y we have to, I think, relate the discussions about clean energy to broader questions in society about capital allocation and economic development. And that's the, f that's the first sort of framing point that I want to make, is that uh, to many people in the environmental community, I think it's self-evident that the energy problem is fundamentally an environmental problem and that the central challenge is decarbonization. And it's important to remember that there are lots of smart, well-intentioned people who just don't see energy that way at all. When they see energy, they don't think primarily or first about the environment. They think primarily about national security and they think of security of supply as being the overarching objective of energy policy. And that's not an illegitimate view as we've seen, especially in the last year or so. Um, similarly, other people would look at the energy business and say, look, the, the access to energy, to affordable energy is fundamental to economic development, both at the household level and at the national level. And so the overarching principle of energy policy ought to be the provision of inexpensive energy in the short run at the private cost. And of course there are trade-offs among these objectives, right? That's what makes energy difficult and complicated and challenging and it's a good thing that we've got all these amazingly talented people of, the, of whom the representatives of this panel are a, a small sample to help us with these problems. Um, <coughs> So let me just say a word about that 10-year-old case. Um, the case had some cost data in it, right? Like capital cost per megawatt, capacity utilization, operating cost per megawatt hour. And in the 10 years since I wrote that case, those numbers have changed not a little, but a lot, right? Like, so natural gas prices in Chile first plummeted because of fracking and the development of a liquefied natural gas fleet and then more recently resurged because of the war in Europe. Uh, <coughs> meanwhile, on the renewable front, um, as you all know, the capital cost per megawatt of wind and photovoltaic fell by maybe 50% at the same time as theoretical capacity utilizations were doubling. So that means two times two is four. It means that the cost per megawatt hour went from something like $100 to something like $25. That is, that is an amazing transition in over a period of 10 years. Now, but the second point that I want to make is the costs have changed a lot. The quantities are much trickier, right? It takes a long time to move an electrical energy system because of sunk costs, because of the installed capital base, and because of the time to build um, <coughs> The, the renewable energy systems that I think most or all of us want and expect to see over the next um, decade. But it takes time and I think that our collective impatience and its political consequences is, a, is actually kind of a serious problem. Like we have political leaders all over the world who are making big statements about what our children and grandchildren are going to do and about net, car net zero or carbon neutrality by some number, some year that always ends in zero or five, right? And the, the danger is that when we miss those targets, as I expect we will, we will conclude that the exercise was futile and it was wasted. And that would be the wrong conclusion, I think, to draw. One of the, and I want to close by talking about two reasons that fossil fuel, besides the sunk cost thing, that I think fossil fuels are so sticky and so persistent. And they have to do with transmission and with um, storage. Right? So on the transmission side, the advantage of fossil fuels is that you can bring them relatively conveniently to a place near the electricity demand and burn them there and have relatively short wires. You can't do that with wind and solar. You have to generate the wind and solar electricity where it makes sense to generate it given uh, <clears throat> where the sun shines and where the wind blows. And that might be quite far from population centers, right? And this is a problem that, um, that Jose Ignacio faces in Chile. Um, there's a long distance between the optimal places to generate wind in the south and solar in the north and the population centers in the middle. And, um, <clears throat> but we're familiar with this in Massachusetts too because uh, there's, to our north in Canada, there's enormous hydroelectric potential, um, cheap, carbon-free, um, and all we need is wire to bring it to us. Um, our neighbors in the state of Maine, 
which used to be part of Massachusetts, and maybe we'd be better off if it still were, um, are quite... I'm not sure um, they will love that. Pardon me? I'm not sure they will love that. Well, I'm not sure they would either, but no. <laughs> you know, Harvard once tried to buy MIT, too. That was in the 19th century. So. <laughs> um, in any case, with the, with the federal system and with the international border between Canada and the United States, the, the problem of constructing transmission lines is even more pronounced in North America than it is in, in, in Chile. Yeah. Um, and, and that constrains our ability here and, and Chile's ability in the south to generate um, electricity using wind and solar. The, the wind and solar, the fraction of time that the wind and solar turbines are operating in Chile is only half of what they're technologically capable of, as I understand it. And it's partly because of these transmission problems. The other way you can solve that problem, obviously, is with storage. Um, but storage is, for now, expensive. I know that lots of um, <coughs> scientific geniuses at MIT and also at Harvard and in Chile are working to bring it down. But we still have an institutional design problem because we expect that we won't be using that storage capacity very often. Maybe once, maybe for a few hours a day, maybe even for a few days a year. But it still has to be built. Nobody builds a hotel with the idea that they're going to use it only on New Year's Eve, right? But we're sort of in that position with respect to electricity storage, and we need institutional innovations to solve that problem so that we create the incentive for public, uh, for, sorry, for private investment in storage capacity. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, I'm super looking forward to these next three presentations. I'm going to be quiet now and get out of the way so that these, these people can um, tell you what they know. So. Thank you, Christian, for the opportunity. Definitely. Th thank you. Me. Thank you. I think the idea of buying MIT is actually brilliant. I hadn't heard it, but uh, definitely look at follow up on that. But let, let, let's get back to let's get back to, to, to energy. Um, and maybe uh, since you've mentioned also a lot of the, 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 the policy here is in, in Massachusetts, maybe we could go to Gail on that. Um, yeah, and, and just, you know, you can tell us a little bit of what's, you know, the, the, the challenges that, that Mass is, uh, is um, uh, confronting at the moment. <laughs> Buen dia. Uh, hearing, uh, hearing the, the Spanish at the beginning um, led me back to um, my time recently in Bariloche uh, and the anxiety I felt trying to order uh, cerveza y café, uh, but also mesmerized by uh, the beauty of the language. So uh, <laughs> thank you for those two experiences uh, simultaneously. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I am Galen Nelson. I'm the Chief Program Officer at the Mass Clean Energy Center. We are the state's clean energy economic development uh, authority, and we're focused on supporting climate solution innovation, um, but we're also uh, equally focused on helping the Commonwealth, the state of Massachusetts, achieve its very ambitious um, climate targets. Um, we have, um, uh, a, a, I would say, a relatively uh, straightforward formula um, for our approach uh, to this work. And um, I was just thinking the other day about how to simplify this, and I think I've actually reduced it to a formula, which is <coughs> um, <coughs> R, D, D, and D, which is, a, I think, a term that many of you may know, um, plus E, I, plus W times E times I. So I'll explain what that is. Um, Research and development, I think that's a certainly a term that all of you um, are likely familiar with. Um, we do a lot of that, um, focused on, on climate. Um, the other Ds, uh, demonstration and deployment, um, supporting later stage um, uh, commercialization acceleration of the climate solution technologies that we support. Uh, EI is equity investment, so we do have a, uh, an equity investment arm at the Mass Clean Energy Center, which is somewhat unique among state clean energy economic development authorities. The W stands for workforce, so we make sizable investments in preparing the existing workforce and also developing a pipeline of workers that we know will be necessary to achieve our climate objectives. Um, and then times E and I, um, which is equity and innovation. And uh, equity is important, I think, for at least two reasons. One, there is certainly a, a moral imperative to make sure that the energy transition, uh, that everyone is included in the energy transition and that is affordable and equitable for um, all citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But there's also a very practical consideration, which is that we simply cannot meet our climate objectives unless nearly every citizen 
and every business um, is part of this transition. So um, that has been a major focus um, for us. And then with regard to innovation, um, I would say that that transcends all of our work. And I think when we, th when we think about innovation, I think most generally um, tend to think first about technology innovation, and that's certainly something that we support um, through a variety of programs. But we also support business model innovation, which is, I think, I think um, in some ways almost more important um, than, than the technology innovation itself. And then innovation in our programs, in our, in our organizational design. So we're very proud of the, I think, innovative program designs that we've supported um, at the Mass Clean Energy Center. Um, over the last decade or so of our um, existence. Um, some very basics, uh, we are, a number of people usually ask how we're funded. We are funded with um, uh, ratepayer dollars, so there's a small surcharge on most electric bills uh, in the state of, Ma not all, but most um, electricity ratepayers, uh, and that amounts to about um, a, a dollar or so a month um, for the typical household, a bit more for um, commercial accounts. And that funding comes to us. It amounts to about $21 million uh, annually. And then there's also a, um, uh, a trust, a renewable energy trust that was created by the legislature over a decade ago. And we've been um, uh, drawing from that over the last, over the last decade. Um, so just quickly running through that formula, um, the, uh, with regard to the research, that's included everything from looking at um, how do we need to deploy energy storage. Uh, we've um, uh, launched a, a, a study, State of Charge, several years ago, looking at how should the state structure policy, what, how should we support energy storage technologies, how should we catalyze the market, and in the end, we launched a series of um, energy storage demonstration projects, utility scale energy storage demonstration projects, not necessarily to demonstrate energy storage technology, but to demonstrate and deploy energy storage um, business models. More recently, we've, um, again, just a couple of examples. More recently, we have um, are in the midst of a study looking at distribution system planning. So how do we optimize um, the grid that we'll need, the electricity grid that we'll need to electrify nearly all end uses, um, building, uh, building electrification, vehicle electrification, and do that in, in a costly manner over the next um, 30 or so years. With regard to um, uh, development, uh, our, uh, the, the D and R&D, um, as I noted, we have a suite of technology development programs that are specifically tailored to meet uh, or fill financing gaps that we've identified. So where the private sector um, does not want to play uh, or doesn't, um, uh, doesn't participate in a, in a way that we believe is rigorous enough, we step in with competitive grant programs to support early stage companies. Uh, as far as the demonstration uh, piece is concerned, this relates to the, the pilot projects that we support to help catalyze uh, and crowd in private investment and launch markets, whether those be energy storage pilot projects or electric bike um, uh, pilot projects or efforts to identify the most cost-effective ways to retrofit our very old um, building stock in, in what is, I think many of you may know, a quite a cold climate here through a good part of the year. Um, so those are some examples of some of the, of the uh, pilot projects that, that we support. On the deployment side, um, we've, the amount of deployment work that we've done over the last eight years has varied somewhat dramatically. Uh, but more recently, we just closed out a solar loan program. So we provided um, private lenders across the state uh, with a loan loss reserve and other credit support that enabled them to initiate over 6,000 uh, loans for um, solar array um, solar array systems on on private homes, uh, and we've also um, helped launch the state's uh, heat pump market, uh, critical to our building electrification and decarbonization efforts with very early stage incentives. And now we've been able to pull back from that effort as um, the market took off uh, on its own. So again, playing a role to catalyze um, those markets. Um, with regard to our investments division, again, this is um, about wanting to crowd in private investment and attract other equity investors to the table. We often lead investment rounds. Um, we're not looking to um, uh, replicate or take the place of private investors, but we also know that hard tech or deep tech, uh, whatever term you prefer, um, requires uh, long-term patient investors, and it's often very important for the public sector to step in alongside our partners in the private sector and make those strategic uh, early investments in, in 
particularly in companies that are developing what we consider to be a critical um, climate solution uh, technologies. Um, I think I, I do have some other slides. I mean, <laughs> really just three, but it uh, might be good to move ahead if possible. Um, <coughs> sorry, I think you might have skipped, skipped over one. Do you have a sticker? Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it. You, you're turning. Okay. So I'm going to turn here because I, I didn't memorize these, but I thought it would be interesting to quickly run through a couple of energy transition uh, axioms or, or universal truths, as I like to think of them. These are not Mass CEC's official uh, universal uh, energy transition universal truths, but I, also, I often wonder to what extent these are broadly shared. So uh, we need climate solution innovation and deployment, and with regard to innovation, we need both disruptive and incremental innovation. Uh, and I, I suspect that that view is broadly shared, um, but it, there's often a somewhat, I think, silly debate in this country about whether we should be investing more in deployment or innovation, and of course the answer is both. Um, and innovation provides a number of benefits, including um, cost reductions of the type that, that Forrest referenced, as, as well as performance improvements, and that helps accelerate adoption of those critical clean energy technologies. We have an enormous workforce challenge ahead of us. Of course, we have a a, uh, a very tight labor market right now, uh, uh, nationally, uh, and here in the state of Massachusetts, and in addition to that, a need to attract and train many, many new workers, uh, particularly electricians, uh, but in other occupations as well, to electrify our, our economy. Um, climate solution innovation and technology is, is evolving faster than regulatory uh, frameworks. Um, this, I think, has been a long-standing challenge for us, um, but it's very difficult to create an environment where uh, markets can grow and, in some cases, even where we can move rapidly on uh, critical demonstration projects when regulatory frameworks often lag behind. Um, finance and construction, two industries key to the energy transition, are um, uh, notoriously cautious and conservative and slow to change, and those are uh, fairly specific examples, but I think um, uh, do um, uh, complicate our, our efforts um, with regard to the energy transition here in Massachusetts, and again, I suspect those challenges are broadly shared. Um, I think the, this, the system optimization piece is interesting. I, if you think about what the energy system, uh, particularly on the electricity side, used to look like, there were a handful of large generators um, feeding a very large number of, of um, end uses uh, and load centers. And now, of course, you have distributed generation. You have a wide variety of mix of, of existing um, renewable and fossil-based generation sources. You have energy storage. You have emerging um, uh, fuels such as hydrogen. How to um, best uh, optimize and invest and integrate all of those, I think, is a very, very difficult challenge for, for policymakers. Um, and then finally, um, the last piece, I think, gets to uh, the need for um, more sophisticated community engagement and uh, social innovation, I would say, around this need to activate and mobilize uh, a much larger swath of the population, including home and business owners, uh, because we really have burned through the early adopters and we really need to uh, mobilize the fast followers or the early majority um, with regard to the market adoption curve uh, if we're to um, uh, deploy the amount of, of clean energy that is necessary to meet our goals both here in Massachusetts and internationally. So again, just some observations that uh, perhaps um, may be relevant to the rest of this discussion and would love to hear whether or not these are, are shared uh, in Chile. And finally, uh, the last slide here, just very quickly, this is a bit of an eye chart, but. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a way to illustrate how we believe we play a role, which is to say that we try to fill those, um, those gaps, the technology valley of death, the commercialization valley of death, with strategic investment. So where the private sector uh, tends not to play and where we see a shortfall in uh, both grant support and investment support, we step in with competitive strategic investments to help uh, Massachusetts companies um, in their race toward commercialization. That's it. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, Jose Ignacio, we, we've heard basically from you know, world class strategy and, and really industrial policy from states uh, such as Massachusetts, which you know it's, it's, it's known to be leading the way not only in the US but also globally in terms of the right policies in terms of pushing, uh, pushing renewable energy and the decarbonization. Uh, it, it's really, you know, it's very welcome to hear that an expert basically in renewables, you've developed all your career on, re all your career on renewables and now you're the CEO of one of the largest upstream companies in Chile, which I think is very telling of the kind of, you know, the kind of, the kind of future that uh, the industry is also envisioning uh, for the energy sector in Chile. So maybe you can tell us a little bit, we heard from Massachusetts, you know, how do you see it in Chile, both with your Kobun hat, but also with your former Aceda hat and others, you know, uh, the, the Chilean reality and, and, and dive from there. Can I go there with the presentation? Absolutely, absolutely, please. <coughs> There it is. Okay, well, thank you for Chile Mass and the invitation and the MIT and Harvard. To be honest, I feel a bit shy of talking about uh, innovation on energy uh, and technology uh, here. <laughs> uh, you should be teaching me and, and I, I should be sitting there, you know. Uh, but anyway, I will, uh, I will try to tell a bit what a, a small uh, utility in Chile. Uh, the only Chilean utility in Chile in the electrical sector is, is trying to do to basically uh, find an equilibrium, you know, more or less what you have mentioned, you know, uh, because this is not about technology, it's not about only uh, economical, it's also about social and environmental. And I think the table has four feet, and you have to find, each country probably, each company has to find its own equilibrium on how to deal with those four very important pillars uh, in order to achieve sustainable development and, and to foster and accelerate the energy transition in Chile and in all the world. It's very important to have those always in mind. Uh, so basically, uh, the Chilean context, you know, um, as, as it was mentioned, uh, the, the, the reduction in capex and the, and the social pressure to accelerate decarbonization uh, in Chile has been extremely high uh, and, and extremely politi politicized. And there you see the evolution. Uh, it's, it's very impressive. Uh, we have a law in Chile that was, uh, was uh, uh, basically forcing to have a 20% of renewable energy by 2025. That goal uh, was achieved five years earlier in 2020. Uh, this year, probably, we're, we're going to hit the, almost the 30% mark, and probably by 2030, we are going to hit the 60% mark. If you add on that the 60%, <laughs> <laughs> not including hydro, huh? which Colbun has a lot of hydro. So if you add the, the, the non-conventional renewable sources plus the hydro by 2030, we'll probably be the 80 90% mark, which is kind of, <laughs> but that's not going to be easy. Huh? Uh, this first 20% was the easy one, probably. Uh, now we are dealing with a, a lot of uh, social tension because of the use of territory. Huh? Just to have some numbers in order to get 2030 uh, and shutting out the coal plants, which is kind of a voluntary target still. There's a, a, a law in discussion at the moment, but currently it's voluntary. Uh, you need to put uh, almost 70% of that capacity uh, in the territory. Huh? And it's a lot of territory that, that the renewables need. Uh, including transmission, storage, and many other things that are needed. So, so the rationale behind this is, is not easy. It's not easy to solve. Um, we are badly uh, used in the couple of decades to do short loss uh, and think only in short term. Uh, and, and if, in fact, the electrical regulatory framework, uh, which was written in, in 1981, has been modified several times only with short loss, thinking in short term. Uh, and we are just, we don't want any more short loss. We want long loss, you know, that are looking long term. And unfortunately, we have been able to start that, that long term discussion uh, uh, for the electrical sector. So, we, so this regulatory framework is sort of, you know, full of uh, bits and pieces trying to accommodate to these new technologies and to the new way that this technology should be deployed, deployed in the system. So what are the, the drivers that are, are fostering, are pushing this? First of all, decarbonization. I probably we all agree here that we need to get rid of fossil fuels as soon as possible. I think that's but we need to do it sensibly, uh, with a technical, economical, social, and environmental perspective. Uh, power plant closures, uh, we had an agreement to, to shut down coal plants by 2014 on a voluntary basis, but today the politicians are discussing to f enforce it by law by 2030. Initially it was 2025, and, and I, when I was in the Renewable uh, Energy Association as president, we were the ones that told the government, easy, <laughs> easy, 
we would love to set it by 2025, but is there any analysis, a technical analysis on security of supply or prices uh, that we can do it on 2025? No, but it's just that this look good, you know. <laughs> we, we like to end things in, in five or zero, right? So, so we run a study for two years in ACERA with the help of the Universidad de Chile and, and you know, the brightest minds that we could find in Chile on the electrical sector. And it was impossible, you know, we, just, uh, we were the Renewable Energy S uh, Association saying we can't shut down 2025 and we kind of got into an agreement that 2030, you know, maybe if we had the right conditions, conditions that I think we have still not met in, in, in the system. Then the social environmental context, uh, we are in a, in a social transformation in Chile, we are writing a new constitution and that has made a lot of tension uh, in the society on how are we dealing with territory, with water, environment, cities, city development, mining industry, and of course that is, that is, that's, uh, has a lot of impact on, the, on, the, on, the, on how energy is, is going to contribute to this new uh, social agreement that we are dealing with in Chile. Yesterday we had a very nice discussion on, on, on that in the Constitution. Uh, so it's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. You know? We don't know actually how it's going to look like the new Constitution how energy and environment is going to be dealt with in the future. And of course, local pollution. And local pollution is probably sort of the, the white elephant in every discussion. We are always talking about you know, CO2 emissions and climate change, which is very important. But we have a lot of local issues on, on, on energy supply, local issues with, with wood firing. Huh? Probably, I know, the ones who don't know, uh, the second primary fuel used in Chile after oil is wood. The second primary energy use is wood. And if you go to Chile in winter to any city, you know, just kind of breathe because of the amount of wood that's burned for, for heating. And nobody has been able to tackle that and solve it. Uh, and, and we can have a 100% renewable system, but we're still burning wood. We will not solve the local pollution issues. That's a big issue. Carbon neutrality, I think uh, uh, that's, this is a very good thing. Okay, Chile committed to be carbon neutral by 2050. Current government is discussing maybe to push it uh, to 2040. Uh, so this is also triggering a lot of industries and a lot of movement uh, for this energy transition. And that, of course, uh, plays uh, energy sector plays a key role. You know, 60% of the contribution of that carbon neutrality will come from the energy sector. Because the energy sector and the electrification of the other industries, like transport, like mining, uh, is, is putting a lot of push on more energy, you know, clean energy, sustainable energy, cheap energy, uh, in order to other industries also decarbonize. And of course, the natural endowment, uh, Chile has no fossil resources, which I think is great for us. We have very good natural resources, far away from the consumption point, which creates a lot of challenges on transmission and storage. But I think uh, what used to be sort of a, a, a big headache, not having fossil fuels, is becoming now sort of a, a real uh, uh, challenging position for, the, for becoming a, a leader. Many countries neighbor have a lot of fossil fuels, and they're sort of struggling of what to do with their fossil fuels because they create a lot of economic development but you know, they're slowing down the decarbonization. Well, we don't have that problem. We just don't, don't have any fossil fuels and we just have to try to rely on our natural resources. So, you know, what are the disruptions that we have seen uh, that are sort of uh, putting a question mark on how are we going to achieve that 60% that I showed at the beginning? First of all, transmission, you know? Where are we going to put those lines in order to put 20, 30 gigawatts of additional capacity uh, in order to achieve decarbonization? and replace that energy, that fossil fuel-based energy with, with, with uh, renewable energy. You know, Professor Ray had mentioned, you know, building a new line, it's really complicated. You know? In Chile, it takes between seven to 10 years to build a new line, and it takes between two to three years to build a new power plant. You know? So always the lines are going behind new, gener new generation. You know? So smart grids, uh, trying to you use as much as possible the, the existing infrastructure, uh, trying to get generation as close as possible to demand, distributed generation, etc. It's becoming a real, real challenge in Chile. Hydrology, you know. Uh, we used to be 55, 60% of our generation coming from a, from a, uh, from a run of river or, or dam hydros, uh, but that now currently is 30, 35%. You know? So hydrology is not, is not, uh, is not giving us uh, some, some air. And unfortunately, the 25, 30% of current non-conventional renewable capacity has not been able to replace fossil fuels, but has, has, has been replacing the hydrology that we, ha we didn't have. So we are still firing more than 50% of generation by, with coal and gas, and the renewables are fitting the space, are filling the space that hydrology you know, left behind uh, these past years. This year was an exception. This year was very, very wet after 15 years of, of drought. 
uh, but you know it's becoming very hard to predict and we were discussing this past days uh, with the MIT uh, on how we could have some help from the MIT of, of trying to find models you know with Horacio here and, and the team uh, on how to deal with you know with, uh, with trying to see how weather and particular hydrology will behave in the long term uh, are we going to have 15 more years of drought are we going to we don't know uh, fuel prices, of course, I don't think I have to mention that. You know, the, the international crisis of, of fuels, it's, it's very complicated and, and it's leading us to a lot of issues in Chile because, you know, we just have to rely on imported fuels and we are just a price taker. We just have uh, any, any power of, 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 of trying to, you know, fix prices. So we just take what, whatever we can. And thermal generation, all those, uh, these this, all three issues have led that uh, incredibly. Uh, we have been trying to shut down coal plants, for example, but the replacement of that energy has not become from renewable sources, has become from diesel plants. So the, the wanted objective of decarbonization and reducing pricing and, and, and contamination has been totally on the contrary. We are replacing coal with diesel plants that are more expensive and more contaminated. You know? It just happened in, in the Concepcion area that uh, a big coal plant was shut down. And a week later, uh, a report was, uh, was managed by the Energy Commission saying that that energy <laughs> was not able, that renewable production was not able to cope with that demand and it had to be replaced with diesel plants in the area. So again, you know, wrong planification. I don't think we have the methodology, the instruments, the, the, you know, the data analysis uh, and the modeling enough in order to support this transition, you know, as, as sensible as possible with this equilibrium that I, that I mentioned before. So basically the, the main concern in Chile is that we want to accelerate the carbonization, we want to accelerate energy transition, uh, while at the same time, of course, maintaining the security the safety the, uh, and the economic uh, standards uh, that you know, people need in order to have cheap, sustainable energy. And also we need the social and the territorial support of that. Yeah. And yesterday in the Smart Cities uh, uh, presentation, it, it, you know, the, the, the part of the socialization of all of this is very important. And in Chile, it's super important. You know? We are, have a very fragile territory. And if just the technicians want to solve this with, without any consultation, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So well, this is what we mentioned. Uh, this is more or less uh, in numbers what ACERA uh, uh, concluded in its study on how can we replace uh, fuels, uh, fossil fuels, mainly coal, by 2030. And there you see the amounts of technologies, including batteries, wind, solar, some CSP, some geothermal, in order to cope with that energy that's going to be taken out for the system. It's a big challenge. Uh, I think for the moment we more or less have 10 gigawatts of those 22 with certainty. So we still have the way to go just to take out coal. Not even, I haven't even mentioned taking out gas or oil of the system. That's going to probably be another study that will require 20, 30, 40 gigawatts uh, of additional capacity between 2030 and 2040. Uh, and the amount of territory and again and lines and, 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 and storage that will be needed, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty incredible. Just for a small country like Chile, imagine you want to do that in the US. You know. So well, we spoke on that. Uh, what are the technologies that definitely need to be fostered and enhanced? And uh, I'm, I'm very glad to of the meetings that we had this week. You know, uh, many bright people are working on uh, transmission technologies, on uh, demand technologies. You know, uh, on new regulation, new frameworks. We have to be really innovative, not only on the, on the technological side, but also very innovative on the regulatory side. You know, how is the regulation? catching up with, this, with these technologies. How do we generate, you know, uh, uh, community involvement? You know, if you go to a community, they are pretty clear that they want clean energy, cheap energy, and they want to power up, you know, the internet, uh, electric vehicles in any community. But they don't want uh, the generation to the power plants, you know. The NIMB is the bananas, all these acronyms that we use, you know, are really, really, really uh, sort of pushing back on, on this new investment. And also as companies, uh, really take the being net positive, not, not even net, net neutral, you know, net positive uh, from all its aspects, it's becoming a really a must to have, a really requirement of society that companies go much more uh, 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 deep involvement you know, in the territories where they're uh, you know, developing their projects and they're generating positive. So it's kind of you get a, 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 a protection uh, around your projects and people feel really that it's a good news to have these projects on the territory and it's not just, just you know, another, another power plant 
bringing up new issues, new problems, etc. So in that way, how are we dealing with all this? All this pressure, all this tension, all these requirements for society. Uh, first of all, we had, we had to sit down. And uh, just as a professor, you know, uh, did a paper on us uh, 10 years ago, uh, we had really to, to go, we had really thought and, and put a lot of effort on going deeper into what uh, Professor Reinhardt uh, highlights uh, 10 years ago uh, and really enhance uh, all the areas that we thought were critical in order to uh, help us achieving our goals of, uh, of installing uh, four gigawatts of new renewables by 2030, uh, which is basically doubling the capacity that Colbun has in the country, uh, which is, you know, four gigawatts may not sound that, good, that much, but uh, for Chile and for us, it's, it's a huge challenge. It's more than we have done in 36 years. We want to do it in seven. And in order to do that, uh, basically, we had defined this, this as our, our key areas. You know, and innovation is playing now a real, real, really important strategy. And not only innovation in technology, but really innovation in the way we deal with communities, in the way we are uh, supporting uh, the regulatory changes needed for that, innovation in the way our existing assets uh, are trying to sort of have a new, a new, a new language uh, in terms of their community engagement and how uh, they support also the, the energy transition. So basically, we are working on, uh, of course, trying to find a way for green hydrogen. Not easy. Uh, it's still expensive. But we are definitely thinking that hydrogen will play a big role in the decarbonization uh, of, of the sector. Water desalination. Uh, Chile has an extreme uh, water uh, issue. Uh, we, are, we are getting drier every day. Our, our, our Atacama Desert grows uh, like 100 meters per year you know, south. So, you know, we are, going, we, are, we are getting drier, drier every year. So we are working very heavily on the salination and also uh, trying to build sustainable solutions for our clients. Our customers want the help to, to help them in order to decarbonize their own processes. So what are we basically now offering? Just not only the energy, but also the management of the energy. We want our clients to consume less megawatt hours and not more. They need to be more efficient. They need to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, and that goes a lot, of, a lot of areas, you know, distributed energy, uh, electrical uh, efficient buildings, that was mentioned yesterday also as a very important part, storage, electrical vehicles, of course, and also uh, monitoring all these and sort of have to re retrofitting. And why all that? Because we need to implement radical and rapid changes and rapid solutions to us and to our clients and to society in order basically to create really uh, uh, an engagement with our clients and with our community to basically allowing our strategic objectives of putting these four gigawatts of sustainable energy uh, viable. Uh, and for that, just not as you know, Bill Gates there said there, it's not just an approach on the technology side, it's also innovation on the social, on supply chains, on markets, on our suppliers, on our clients, etc. You know, we have to all be part of this transition. It's just, this is not just a quest for generators or a quest for, you know, transport companies. Everybody has to play a part on this, on this game. And just a small highlight on, on how we're to, to, to put social innovation at a, at the center. Uh, we are doing many things. You know, we were the first company in Chile and one of the first in LATAM to start uh, putting desalination plants in the, in the makeup water that we use for our gas, gas plants. Uh, so, we're, so you know, and that has achieved us to reduce 60% of the water consumption in very critical water areas in Chile, like Quillota or, or in Concepcion. Uh, and now we are building a second osmosis plant to reuse the, rejection, the rejected water of the, of, of the desalination plant, you know, and that will achieve an, an 80% of uh, reduction in, in water consumption. Uh, also, we have built uh, in our water reservoirs, uh, parks, uh, protected areas. So basically we are trying to transform a power plant into a park that has a power plant. Not a power plant with a park, but a park with a power plant. <laughs> and that, that, that has really changed the life of the people around, you know. So they, 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 they don't see us anymore as the company that, you know, put a dam, you know, and flooded the area. No, we, we have now a national park with protected areas uh, for tourism, and we have developed also local, local uh, small local companies to basically uh, facilitate services, restaurants, you know, either you see canoes, uh, administering the beach, etc. And that has really totally changed, you know, the way community is seeing us with our current uh, 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 dam, dam power plants. We are building also new developing new technologies, for example, for cleaning systems and uh, for panels, pyrometers, etc., trying to put uh, automations because these this power plants uh, usually are located in the desert. It's very hard to access. 
you know, a lot of issues with transport, with getting there. So basically, automation and technology in solar power plants is something that we are trying to do. Uh, for example, in the, in, the, in the osmosis plants that we are building for the gas plants, uh, once the membranes are used, and has, instead of just, you know, throwing them to as waste, we are doing some innovation there to re reuse them and, and put some, uh, some uh, systems to clean the water for, uh, for communities, faraway communities. You know? And many more things, you know, reusing, you know, for example, the, the, the clothes that people use, uh, the parkas and all the things for the cold, we, we take them, we reuse them, and we use the, the, the insulation to build insulation material for new buildings, for communities. You know, and many other things that I think are going into the way of social innovation at the center of our business in order to have sort of a protection for the projects, for the society, and they see as, as really, you know, making the, the community participating in this, in this energy transition. So just to sum up, accelerate energy transition needs innovation at the technological, community, social, and environmental side. We have to work together with the people, people at the center, in order to make this happen. Uh, it's very challenging, but I think companies have to play a key role on this transition. Uh, and basically be part of, you know, a, a community around the energy transition with authorities, the political system, private sector, civil society, and basically everyone that needs to play a role on this transition. So thank you very much. There are some of the awards that we have had this year on, on these issues, and uh, thank you for the, for the time and opportunity to present here. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, you may have in your timings that this, this panel is ending around 10.30. We've uh, adjusted things, so we're going to finalize closer to 11, so no worries. There'll be a little bit of time for, for questions and discussion. Um, so let's go a little bit from, the, from you know, what, what a I mean, fantastic overview in Chile and, and, and very honest on the challenges. Uh, it's great. Uh, and then, you know, going through what the larger company is trying to do, and let's go to a little bit of so the technology side and most of the micro, I mean, w most of the things that you've, you've mentioned, um, Cos Ignacio also, they, they, they really need solutions in terms of storage. Uh, and of course, Felipe is going to bring us the, the example of how can we improve that side with, you know, what, what you guys are doing on, on, on lithium. So you can take the floor. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, and I want to, um, to thank Chile Mas for the invitation. And to be honest, I am very uh, honored to, to be in this panel with you. So, uh, and I will try to keep the presentation short because I know that we are a little bit late, uh, so we can have some, some time for, for a conversation. So, uh, as you know, like the world is moving to uh, electro mobility. Uh, most of the major automakers have done very um, high goals to become 100% of the vehicles, 80% of the vehicles, or 50% of the vehicle for the next decade. And that means uh, a lot of challenge for the whole world. So as you know, gasoline has already peaked, uh, and all the automakers are going to the electric vehicles. Uh, and lithium is the new gasoline. So there is a lot of development of new batteries, but all of them have lithium. And if you think in a world with 100% of the electric vehicles with batteries, we need to ramp up the production 30 times. And this is complex because you can find lithium in brine under the salars, and you can find lithium in rock around 70% or 75% of the resources around the world are on the brine. But currently, around 80% of the production is coming from rock. The rock industry has a lot of the environmental problems that we know from rock industry. There is a lot of development and new technologies. But the truth is that if we want to get this 30 times production of, of lithium, we have to go to the lithium that is in brine. And get lithium from brine is not easy. Each brine, if you go to any of the salars that you can find in South America, each of the salars have totally different kind of brine. The chemistry is totally different. Some of them has a lot of magnesium, other ones have a lot of boron, some of them has a lot of lithium, another one are not too much lithium. So the truth is that it's not only a, a, um, 
a situation that we can or we need to produce from brine, but it's also it's, it's not easy to do. And the truth is that right now, the only way to extract lithium from brine is using evaporation pumps. And basically, what is evaporation pump? You pump out brine, you put it in a huge plastic swimming pool, and you wait one, two years to get the sun, do it, wo it, 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 it work, and evaporate all the water that you have. And then you can get, in the best scenario, around 45% of the lithium. All of the other lithium is lost in the process, and at the end, you get like big mountains of waste, other minerals that you cannot use and are not commercial at all. So uh, this is right now how we are producing lithium in the triangle of lithium. That is what we have in the north of Chile, north of Argentina, and Bolivia. And also there is a lot of problem with the environment. Because as you can may imagine, if you deploy all the brine, it can affect freshwater reservoirs. So what is Lilac doing? We have developed our own technology. Uh, Lilac was founded around five years ago. And we are one of the uh, DLE companies that are trying to change the world. DLE it means direct lithium extraction. And um, our process is 10,000 times faster. So we don't have to wait two years of, the of our, our evaporation pumps. Our process lasts no more than two hours. Uh, we can get a thousand times smaller footprint because if you need these huge evaporation ponds, uh, you need a lot of foot footprints in the place of the, of the, of the extraction. And because our uh, technology is modular, uh, we need a very, very, very small area to, to deploy our technology. And also, with our technology, we can get up to 90% of the lithium, so we can, we can multiply for two or three times uh, the production of current producer of evaporation ponds. We have a proven technology. We have probably we have the biggest or largest brine library in the world. We have more than 60 brine from different salars around the world, from geothermal projects, and even from oil and gas um, um, deployment brine. Um, we have engaged in uh, several projects. Right now we have done a pilot plant here in the US we are commissioning a second plan in Argentina and doing the last part of this year and next year, we are deploying three other pilot plans in South America. And from a technical point of view, we have done already two pre-feasibility studies. We are doing four more and we are finishing our first DFS, that is the final step before to go and uh, build the first uh, DLE commercial plant in the world. Um, and we have a really good uh, investment portfolio. Um, you can see some of them, BMW, SK, one of the biggest producers of batteries, Sumitomo, lower carbon. We have our, uh, as part of our um, in, uh, early investor was uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures um, that is uh, founded by Bill Gates. Uh, the engine that is uh, venture capital related with the MIT. Uh, and we have been choosing in the last two years of one of the 100 tech um, clinic uh, startup to, to, to watch around, uh, around the world. So basically, this is the main difference. So the ponds, you can see there are some ponds that we can find in South America. The other uh, picture is our pilot plant. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, the footprint is, 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 is completely different. Um, with ponds, you need a very specific brine chemistry. So you need high concentration of lithium, and you need that the ratio between some of the impurities, specifically magnesium to lithium, cannot be higher than 20. Our pilot plant in the in, in United States, uh, we extract lithium from a brine that the ratio was 200 to 1. So um, with Lilac, you can go to almost every brine resource and extract lithium. Um, to do pilot plant with evaporation ponds and then the commercial plant with evaporation ponds, you need to wait two years to know if what you are doing is right and then you have to still like tuning all the, all the ponds. With Lilac, uh, in three years, you can have a, a, a commercial project um, running. And as I told you, the recovery 
with operation points are around 45 or even less. And with our technology, uh, we are expecting around 90%. Um, and the product quality, because the operation point, you have a lot of impurities, you are dealing all the time with final impurities in the uh, lithium product that you have to send to battery maker. Because we are extracting just the lithium, the quality and the, the purity of the, our final project is um, really high and can go directly without polish second stage uh, to the um, battery maker. So I don't want to go to, to everything that is, that is written there, but um, basically what we do is we put the brine in a big tank with little bits, little balls that we have developed and that we built in-house. And there is a chemical reaction. So uh, when these balls touch the brine, the ball take the ion of lithium of the brine, and after one hour, one hour and a half, you can get the lithium out of the system with exactly same pH and chemistry of the original brine. So you can re-inject in the salar, keeping all the environmental concern um, um, taking care of that. And then you wash the bits and you get this concentration of lithium that you can go uh, directly to a battery maker. This is a little bit of what we are doing. So as I told you, 70% of the resource of lithium around the world are in the salar in South America. So you can imagine we are a, a, an American company with um, the R&D headquarters, everything in uh, Oakland, California. We are starting to build a manufacturer in Nevada, but probably 90 or more percent of our project will be in South America. So this is very interesting because this bridge between what we are talking now, Massachusetts and Chile, or in our case, California and Chile, is very important. And I think we have a lot of opportunities from a South American Chilean point of view to work with this new technology developed in the United States. And I think there is a lot of companies developed in the United States that really need uh, the capability that we have in South America, not only the natural resources, but also the people. Um, so finally, just to give a couple of ideas, um, the lithium triangle, the lithium triangle is needed for the energy transition and to get the dream of have 100% of the electric vehicles um, adoption. Uh, the new technology and adoption for the green mining, I will say that the mining sadly have been one of the industries that have adopted new technology at a slower path. So I think there is a real opportunity. A real opportunity. There is also green hydrogen and there is a lot of regulation and public policies in Chile that are pushing in that direction. And also in South America and Chile, you can find a lot of rare air and other mineral opportunities that I think is very interesting for, for, for this uh, conference. The strategic mineral and resources, um, the United States is taking a lot of care of what um, the strategy policies they are developing. So right now there is a Department of Energy a grant for a strategic project. Uh, there are state and federal funds uh, and a lot of support. And there is a lot of clean tech investment fund like Breakthrough Energy Ventures that are looking to do things in places like Chile and South America. And there are some like opportunities quite basically, but uh, easy to pilot new technologies. Uh, South America is easy to pilot new technology and specifically Chile. Uh, the language and culture is if you jump to Chile, it's easy to jump to another places in South America. And finally, a very simple thing, but time zones, you know. I work a lot with people in, uh, in Australia and Europe, and thanks God, our headquarters are in California, so we can be connected basically the whole day. And finally, there are two pictures. The ESG part of our company is fundamental. So the first one is with one of the communities that we are working. We are not visualizing the EV transition if we are not working with the communities and with the people uh, that are around the resources. And the second one is the Pachamama, as we call in, in South America, that is the Mother Earth, that if we don't take care of them, future mining project and the electrification is not a real possibility. Everyone wants to drive a Tesla or an electric vehicle, but they don't want to do it from a lithium that is contaminating from a rock industry or from projects that we are affecting the environment in South America.
Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry I extend a little bit. Okay, we'll we'll have a, we have we're going to wrap up exactly at 11, so we have 15 minutes for a round of questions. Uh, I have a number of questions, but I'm not going to ask any because I uh, would like uh, to give the, the, the public the opportunity. Uh, please, uh, if you could quickly identify yourself, ask a brief, brief question that finishes with a question mark, uh, and uh, and 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 uh, give it away, please. So, sir, go ahead. Understood. Got it. Thank you very much. Let me pick up. So, so let me try to pick up one or two more, and then we'll just leave it with the with the panelists. Uh, is there anyone? Yuli Fuentes. You were like. Yes. Tell me. Short. Uh -huh. Okay, that's what I can tell you. Um, I'll take maybe, uh, yeah, him. Okay, maybe let's uh, start with that, see if we have a little bit more time. Um, so, uh, Corey, would you like to start with some reflections or? Let's start with Corey. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic, let's, uh, let's, let's do that. Well, first on the, on the numbers, uh, the numbers that I show, it's on energy, not on capacity. So we are now uh, close to 30% of 
energy production in, in terms of uh, non-conventional. So capacity is around uh, 14 gigawatts. So capacity is like 40, 45%, but on energy, because of the capacity factors, it's around 30, 30 32. So it's all on, on energy. And uh, I agree, it's not the same, because uh, you know, base load against you know, variable technologies, uh, it's, it's hard to compare. So what we have been doing in Acera here is trying to compare, for example, when a solar PV with batteries is going to have an LCOE of the whole system comparable to coal or gas. You know, that, that's more or less the metrics that we try to use because exactly that's the problem. You know? uh, it's, it's not the same to put a, 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 a green electron that you don't know when it's going to be in the system rather than to have base load generation. So our, you know, now the, the, the capex uh, increase in batteries and in, and in windows solar, it's kind of a bit tricky, but projections, and we hope to you know, recover the trend of you know, reducing, we think that between 27 or 2030, we will have an LCOE of a wind or solar facility with batteries able to compete uh, on a mega, on an M dollar per mega on our basis with a, with a coal or gas. Now, honestly, to be saying with the current uh, gas and, and coal prices, that probably may be even uh, before than that. But uh, yeah, there will be a point that you will be able to shut down uh, coal and gas uh, with batteries if they are built uh, sustainable <laughs> and then uh, probably within the, the end of this decade. Okay. Okay. Felipe, maybe if you want to take, uh, there was one particular to you, I think. That's why. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, we have been working with, with, with other companies or institution, and I will say that uh, the more official one is a new coalition that we have created here to influence in public policy around strategy minerals and especially how the things can be done internally in U.S., but also uh, with funds to invest in, in other parts of the world. So yeah, we are working on that. We are a technology company. We have uh, different families of patents and IP, so also we are quite uh, cautious about uh, what is our technology doing because it's our asset, but uh, we are working with other institutions and companies to, to try to push the things and, and, and move forward. Fantastic. The other, I think there were two questions addressed to you in terms of collaboration and um, if the fund was invested directly. Yes. Uh, so I think on the collaboration question, um, if I could point to, I, I would say, two concrete examples. One is that there are certainly innovators here in Massachusetts that have technologies that are um, relevant here for our energy challenges, but also relevant um, broader domestically and, and internationally. And so we'd love to export that. Uh, and now hearing this wonderfully inspiring story of Lilac, um, and certainly this is not the first time aware of uh, innovators in Chile that are developing technologies that are applicable here. So I think to the extent that we can explore uh, demonstration project opportunities um, across the international borders uh, that make sense, um, uh, for all parties, that, that's a real concrete opportunity. I think the other is around this concept of community engagement and social innovation, which is that even with the flood of financing from the Inflation Reduction Act, from state incentives, uh, the private investment sitting on the sidelines, um, ESG focused, wanting to get in the game, we're going to continue to face um, renewable energy siting challenges from transmission to um, large PV systems to offshore wind and beyond. And I, we, we need to get much smarter about how to engage, make, first of all, make populations aware of the benefits of clean energy, the necessity of the energy challenge and transition, and be much more creative and innovative in the way that we engage communities around um, renewable energy um, uh, project deployment. So I think those are two areas where we could collaborate. Uh, Forrest, please. Yeah, so one of the things that emerged over and over again in this conversation was that Innovation, if you define it narrowly as just the invention of new machines or new technologies, isn't going to be enough, right? It has to be complemented by institutional change, um, which will enable the innovation and create the um, economic climate in which the technologies can deliver their benefits to society. And so Jose Ignacio had a quote from Bill Gates about how innovation isn't just inventing new machines, it's inventing new ways of thinking about the world. And I, I think. That's, I think, in part an answer to your question about whether we're over-promising. 
But we are absolutely overpromising if we don't. If we're going to rely on the engineers to solve this problem, we're overpromising because we need to. We need institutional change as well. The, with particular respect to the green hydrogen, my understanding yeah. of hydrogen is it it's a carrier device, right? So it's a way of exporting the um, the solar and wind capabilities of. Chile or of some other place where it's relatively inexpensive to generate green electricity, um, it will only work in the context of an open international trading architecture, right? If, and, and that's why the national security thing is so important because if nations turn in on themselves and think, well, I'm going to solve my energy security problems through autarky, through self-sufficiency, then we'll leave these gains on the table. And presumably you were talking about that same thing when you were talking about food yesterday down the river, right? It's if we if we don't maintain the openness of the trading system and we rely on individual countries or even states trying to solve their own problems, it will forego so many gains from trade that we will impoverish ourselves and conclude that we can't afford the environmental benefits that we should aspire to get. But yeah, I was going to ask you maybe, Jose Ignacio, you, you can tell us just directly, also specifically on the question on where are we in Chile, right? Because we just passed the new policy, uh, so maybe just comment on green hydrogen specifically to address it regarding. Yeah, there was also a question on desalination. Uh, I think desalination is, is one of the top three tension points in Chile, you know, how are we going to deal with water? So, so definitely uh, not only Corbun, but, you know, I think we, we are all trying to find new technologies to, to desalinate cheaper, faster, with less energy consumption. Um, and, you know, I'm sure some of the bright minds here will be looking at technologies and we will certainly be uh, trying to, to, you know, test them in Chile or do some piloting on, on, on new ways to, to, to desalinate and, and produce energy from, some produce water from, from different sources. And regarding re green hydrogen, um, I'm optimistic, I think, uh, I, not all consumption can be electrified. Uh, there will be some uh, usage of, uh, of, of liquid fuels, uh, definite for sure. Um, so I agree that fuels are going to be needed, but may, maybe not fossil fuels. Uh, probably hydrogen will start taking a place in, in, in many areas, aviation, you know, sea transport, uh, industrial processes that need heating, need, need heat, you know. Uh, and definitely technology will surprise us, as always, you know. Uh, I, I was recently with some guys from, from GE, they are currently testing gas turbines that are able to be uh, as efficient as a conventional gas, uh, close, uh, open cycle gas, uh, using 50% hydrogen, uh, with very few changes in the technologies. So probably we'll be having, you know, 100% uh, hydrogen-fired gas plants in the future, before it goes by. And that will make us, for example, use the existing uh, piping, the, the, the piping infrastructure, which is huge in the world, uh, not just to, you know, pipe uh, and, and, and move gas, but move hydrogen, you know. Uh, there are some challenges, you know, because hydrogen is much volatile and, and things, but that's going to, that's a technolo technology problem that's going to be solved for sure. So I think uh, uh, hydrogen will be used at all levels. Probably another good thing is that it's very easy to produce hydrogen, you know. You can have an electrolyzer in a container shipped to your house or to your building or to your factory in a in, in couple of days, and it's plug and play. Uh, same as at the desalination plant, really. So, so yeah, we will be seeing distri distributed hydrogen production probably bes be beside factories. Uh, you will see high, big, uh, uh, big uh, hydrogen factories to to, ex to export in this international trade that we need. Maybe uh, you know change it to ammonia to make it easier to transport or whatever. But I see a bright future for, for green hydrogen. I think there's still a competitiveness issue, big competitiveness issue. That, yeah. but again, technology economies of scale will start playing a big role there. The, uh, but yeah, I see a bright future for, for green hydrogen in Chile. Yeah, absolutely, and I think there's also a question of how much is going to, in terms of export import of, of hydrogen, how much is going to be the premium that your uh, buyer is going to be able to is, is going to to buy. And I think it's very interesting to see developments such as uh, you know the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism in the EU or the things that are happening in the US because uh, it's maybe you're going to be able to, to compete compete on price. Uh, much earlier than what we have thought in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of hydrogen. Actually, Harvard Business School uh, wrote last year a case of green hydrogen in Chile, which was taken from the experience of uh, Minister Jovet and uh, and actually a student that I don't think is here, Benjamin Manuenda, who was the, the uh, writing that policy for the Ministry of uh, of the Energy. So it's uh, it's very interesting to see if you want to take a look at, at green hydrogen that took uh, that took that, that to take that uh, HBS took la last year. 
I think uh, we're exactly on time, 10.59, on time, on revised time, right? on Chile on time. <laughs> on Chile on, on updated time. Thank you, I, I want to, you know, absolutely thank you to all the panelists, particularly Professor Reinhardt that actually moved an appointment for half an hour for us. Uh, and it was fascinating discussion. If, if I can just leave you with one word, I think we, we spoke about, you know, the, 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 the political challenges, the technical challenges, uh, and, you know, get a lot of, you know, first impressions of challenges, uh, examples of how, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth is, is managing these challenges, which is always, you know, world class. Things that we're doing in Chile, a little bit of, you know, a, a little bit of difficulties, but also a lot of hope, right? Uh, and I think uh, really Felipe was, was wonderful to hear you uh, and see, you know, how we're technology is trying to overcome these solutions and hopefully how, po how can policy accompany this and really to understand, and I think all the panelists said that, that this is not only a, both a resources and a political uh, challenge, but very much also a social challenge, right? It's about social innovation, about how ESG and how do you build the communities into it, because you may have all the technology there, but if you're not able to build, you know, sustainably in accordance to your own communities, you know, those transmission lines, those plants, et cetera, you're going nowhere. So it's really important that the whole community understands that these challenges is from us all and not for just a couple of people in the industry. So with that, again, I please give me a, uh, help me uh, give me a big applause to the panel. And <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Now we have a coffee break, half an hour, and at 11.30, again, in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Our great panel.